see um we're gonna start now good morning everybody um welcome to our breakout room which is latinos confronting oppressive systems in oregon a uh, discussion about the intersectionality between racism in our institutions immigration processes schools and beyond um before i begin i would like to remind everybody to submit your questions in the q a feature of the Huva app um, and if you have any questions, please raise your hand. I will be monitoring our Q&A feature and I will make sure that all of your questions are answered. Um, before I give a short overview of our organization, Latino Network, uh, I would like to say first that my name is Martina Bialik. I am the Associate Director of Communications and Media Relations for Latino Network. Now, we would like to do a land acknowledgement before we begin. We acknowledge the land on which we sit and which we occupy. The Portland metro area rests on traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Molala, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River, creating communities and summer encampments to harvest and use the plentiful natural resources of the area. We take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land. Now, I would like to give you all a short overview of who we are as an organization. Um, Latino Network was founded in 1996 by community leaders who grew concerned about the lack of adequate resources to meet the needs of the growing Latino community. Um, and now Latino Network has evolved to become an organization that encompasses transformational programs aimed at educating and empowering Tri-County area Latinos. We are a Latino-led education organization grounded in culturally specific practices and services that lifts up youth families to reach their full potential. Our work springs from the core belief in Latino community self-determination, which is the ability of community members to participate meaningfully in the decisions that affect their lives and the lives of their families. For the past 20 years, Latino Network has stood at the forefront of the fight for systems change in our state. During the session, leaders of our organization will give an overview of the community-based work our, organizations, our organization has embarked on to elevate the struggles community members have been subject to by our state's education, justice, immigration, and criminal systems. On that note, I will take it, I will leave um, the floor to Ana Munoz and she will do an introduction and take it from here, Ana. Gracias, Martina. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome. I'm glad that uh, you are joining us. My name is Ana Munoz. I am the Director for Community Engagement and Leadership Development at Latino Network. And I've been at Latino Network for the past seven years. Uh, I'm an educator by profession. And so for me, the work that I do at Latino Network, it really um, in, entails working for the people, uh, working for system changes, working uh, towards moving and inclusion, equity, um, uh, spaces for, for our communities of color. So I'm really, really glad to be here and have this conversation um, and really be able to share what our work really um, looks like in, in a sense, not, not every you know day-to-day -day kind of uh, activities, but definitely I'm gonna be talking about a little bit about the work that I do with the, what the redistricting efforts that are happening right now, um, the work that I do um, uh, involved as a school board member and also the work that I do uh, in my involvement at the city level as well. So I'll be sharing some examples in terms of, of what these systems really look like that are oppressing our, our, our people in ways that we don't even have a clue or ways that we haven't really identified. Uh, but once we have those conversations, we'll be able to assess ourselves um, and see what's happening in, in our surroundings and, and be, it, be able to make um, some changes on the way we approach our systems. So with that, I'll allow my, my colleague Antonio to introduce himself and then we'll get started. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Martina. And uh, good morning, everyone. We are so thrilled to 
uh, be having the opportunity to have this important uh, conversation this morning. I think that for Latino Network, uh, uh, currently uh, many challenges working with uh, uh, our community in the issues that affect them are so important. And we acknowledge that Latino Network uh, cannot uh, do everything by itself. So we are grateful of partnerships that we have in the community. And uh, we are grateful to have the opportunity to be here this morning uh, talking to you all. Uh, my name is Antonio Ramirez. Uh, my background is in social work. And I, I have worked for Latino Network for almost seven years. Uh, the last two years, I have been participating in different coalitions in Oregon with the goal of advancing, advancing immigrant rights. And also within the scope of my work, I, prov I provide direct services to immigrants who are at risk of deportation. Within this work, uh, uh, I have found uh, really how a uh, systematic racism is embedded in our institutions and uh, how uh, it affects people, people from our community, not just the Latino community, but also other people of color. So I believe that our work is so crucial with other organizations in order to overcome those challenges that exists for our communities. So I'm gonna be speaking during my presentation about uh, how difficult it was for our community, for our immigrant community, the last uh, federal administration that implemented almost 400 uh, policies on immigration uh, to uh, prevent and to uh, uh, be uh, discouraging legal and illegal immigration. So I'll talk about that uh, later. And thank you, Anna. You are uh, next. Gracias, Antonio. Okay, great. So um, part of the work that we do at Latino Network is, in terms of community engagement, uh, we want to focus on engaging our community in meaningful uh, work that affects their everyday lives. Last year, I was involved on in the Census 2020 campaign, and I was part of a um, group of about 12 organizations that were um, uh, culturally specific organizations, making sure that we uh, went out, and actually we didn't go out because of the pandemic, but we made sure that we made every effort to reach out to our communities of color so they can be counted on the census. And believe it or not, uh, there was a lot of fear with that. A lot of fear in, in many different levels for many different reasons. And it was our job to make sure that we gave authentic firsthand information to our community members so they understood what the census was all about and also the process. Well, our efforts paid off because uh, the count um, ended up giving us an additional six um, district, uh, six um, let's just, um, district within Oregon, and and that's a win for us. Um, now, currently, we are in the second phase of what happens after the census, and that is that redistricting. A lot of people don't have any clue about what that redistricting process is and why we shouldn't, right? Because it happens every 10 years. And so if we're not informed about what that process is, I'm sure like I'm gonna forget in 10 years because that's a very long time. However, with that redistricting of, uh, of our communities, it's very important for our, our people to really understand what that is because that entails who, who represents our communities. That entails the, the federal funding that comes into our communities. And, and with the redistricting, there's, in, um, there's a, an action. There is a, there's this thing that is called gerrymandering. And I don't know if any of you heard of what gerrymandering is, but that is the action that affects on how redistricting should be divided in ways that only favors one political party. And so if we don't know that information um, and we don't get involved in, in, in this process, that is, is uh, it's an action that is gonna be oppressing our communities 
for the next 10 years and, and beyond. So my work right now is to make sure that our communities really understand what this process of redistricting is and in getting them involved in ways that they can uh, offer testimony at the legislation that happened in March and April. And there's gonna be a few more um, sessions coming up. Um, and also with the work, we want to, we have a project in place at Latino Network that could represent what is happening in our community. And one of that projects um, was an art project. In that art project, I wanted that to be, um, I wanted to include the voices of our youth, the voices of our families to design what that project should be. And after I received enough in input, that art project ended up being a memorial garden. And why a memorial garden? Because in our community, we are suffering, um, our families are suffering, our community is suffering uh, from gun violence from gang violence, from you know, all these different violences that are affecting our communities in ways that we cannot believe. And so our community um, needs a space for, for healing, a space for, for really uh, going to that space and have quiet moment and really reflect on their loved one uh, that has passed without them being on the streets. Cause I don't know if, if, you know, on the streets there's usually little memorials when people um, lose their, their lives in that spot. We don't want our youth or our families to go to those memorials on the street. So what we're doing is we're making this special space for our community, for our family um, to come and, and just stay away from the streets. And so um, we're gonna have an unveiling event happening June where we're going to invite some of our community members to come and do rock painting and they're going to dedicate a, a rock for one of their loved ones uh, and that is going to represent that that memorial garden is going to reflect that it, it's going to symbolize what's happening in our community and, and and it's just you know an example of the work that we do and how we approach how this redistricting effort comes down to an art project in a way that we bring it to the community so they can understand this big concept of redistricting, but they can understand it in a way that uh, there's something meaningful for them. And the Memorial Garden is, is something that is really bringing, bringing uh, their, the, is opening up their, their minds in terms of about what redistricting is. So to me, it's something very special that, that I'm uh, working on with um, my colleagues at Latino Network and, and, and really symbolizes and, and represents the work that, that we do. The other thing that I do is I am a member of the uh, Reno School Board. I ran uh, for candidacy in 2019 and um, I have ended up being voted in, which is really exciting. But I come in into a system where I really see the inside of the education system and how it works and how that plays out and, and how our community perceives it, our students perceive it. So um, at Reynolds School District, our demographic is about uh, close to 11,000 students. 71% uh, of the students are students of color and 29% of them are, are white students. The majority of our faculty are white and, and we wanna balance that. We wanna make sure that our faculty represents the, the students that are part of our, our student body. There's a lot of disparities on how students of color are being disciplined. Uh, there's uh, low grad graduation rates for our students in special education, our students in ELD, um, in our ELD program. And, and that needs to be pushed forward. Those numbers have always been on the bottom lines and, and there's always this gap between uh, um, graduation attainment for students in special ed and students in, in English language learning programs. And, and we need to move beyond that. We need to make sure that we're working in, in having our students reach their, their end goal of graduation 
And so there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, policies that need to be in place in order for that to be pushed forward. And that's what I'm part of with that with the Reynolds School Board. Um, also, um, you know, our current recently we had the new special election, and with the new special elections, we had a lot of uh, candidates for school board. That's something that is barely happening. Whereas before, it was difficult to even find a candidate. Uh, for even one, you know, one seat. So at Reynolds, we had nine candidates uh, running for four seats. And on, on May, um, May 18th, the results were that two, for the first time, two Asian Americans are have been elected for uh, one of these those seats, and one Latino, two Latinos and two Asian Americans. And there's already three Latinos. This is the first time that the Reynolds School Board is 100% people of color, directors of color. We have four Latinos and two uh, Asian Americans. That to me is really exciting and, and I can't wait to get to work with, with the whole um, team of directors for the 2021-2022 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, school year. It's gonna be the year that changes are going to be coming up in, in ways that um, are going to be reflecting uh, the needs of our students in our community. So I'm really excited about that. Also, uh, part of my uh, work, um, I'm part of the Grow Your Own Teacher Pathway Program. And that program is led by Monoma ESD in partnership with uh, school districts, school districts from Monoma County and uh, different colleges and universities. And my work was to recruit members of the community to be part of this uh, project um, if they wanted to be teachers. We want to diversify the teacher faculties in every district. We want to make sure that those candidates have a pathway to becoming teachers. And and it's been very rewarding. It's been a lot of system breaking kind of work because in our organization, we have our early learning program. In our early learning program, we have different educational programs. We have Juntos Aprendemos, which is the, the, the program for uh, three to five-year-olds. And then we have programs for smaller kids, right? And these programs have been running for more than like 15 years in, our, in this community. Um, a lot of the, the, the teachers in those programs are monolingual Spanish speakers, teaching early learning, culturally specific in Spanish for these kiddos, preparing them for kindergarten. And so they've been doing this for, for 10, 12, 15 or more years. And now they wanna be teachers, right? And so then we have this Grow Your Own Teacher Pathway program. So I invited our staff and said, who wants to be a teacher? And those that said yes, we enrolled them in the program. Now the question was, the question from me to, to the team was, okay, now I have this cohort. A lot, of, the majority are uh, Spanish monolinguals. How are they gonna go through uh, college courses when the college courses are only offered in English, right? And so the, the, the thinking cap, you know, they, they started wearing their thinking cap. And they're like, that's right. You know, we have a lot of monolingual speakers in different languages. If they choose to become teachers, how are we going to serve them? How are we going to help them? How are we going to get them through college coursework that is only offered in English? Well, you know, guess what my response was? I said, I'm a teacher by profession, right? So I said, let's teach some of those courses in those specific languages. So what do I do? I signed up to teach one of those courses, which is Ed 100, which is Introduction to, to, to Education in, in Spanish, but more than Spanish, bilingually, because I also wanna make sure that I'm, I'm supporting my community in developing those uh, English skills. So for the first time, uh, the institution, uh, PCC, is offering Education 100 bilingually in Spanish. And those are the systems that we have to break. Those are the, those are the um, ideas that we have to bring forward. If there's a problem, let's follow up, follow it up with the solution. And, and it's how we, I've been letting my work in, in, in this 
in this area. With my community engagement involvement, I uh, recently was voted in into the um, the um, community engagement committee for the city of Fairview, right? And I applied back in December and I was voted in, in in November. I didn't know I had to be voted in. That's a volunteer work. By the way, um, my work for the school board is also volunteer work. Um, and so my work with the community engagement committee for the city of Fairview is also volunteer. And I applied thinking that's all I needed to do. But no, there was a process of you, you, you had to be screened, your application had to be screened, you had to be reviewed by the commissioners, and then the commissioners had to vote you in. Those, I didn't know that system. I didn't know that that was the process. And there's a lot of that in, in, our, in our communities. When we want to serve in a specific uh, city level, county level, a lot of times we don't know the processes, which is our intention is to serve, but very unfamiliar with the what the process is, is to, to get to those seats. And that's something that is keeping us from not being in the spaces that we need to be to represent our community. So anyway, so I come to this space with the uh, community engagement committee and I, I, uh, I come to a space with these lovely ladies. They're, they're very um, invested in the community, uh, very engaged, very, uh, um, proactive and making sure that they're offering the community um, different opportunities for getting involved uh, or participating in events and whatnot. Um, the only thing is that they're all white and there's nothing wrong with them being white. What is wrong is the, the, their thinking and like I said, they have best intentions. You know, they, they want to do anything they, they can to serve and be uh, present for a community. But a lot of times the, the, the mindset, when, when the, we don't have people of color involved, then we, we miss out on what really, what our community wants, right? So the first event this year was our Easter, um, our Easter event. And, and the Easter event in the past has been with music and food and an Easter egg hunt for the kiddos and a very uh, festive and, and fun celebratory and whatnot. But of course, with the pandemic still happening right now, they couldn't have that last year or this year. <clears throat> but this year they were creative in uh, coming up with a drive-through uh, kind of a Easter event where we handed out goodie bags with Easter eggs and, and a, a lot of information. And, and I asked, okay, well, this is great and all, but um, how do we know our community wants this event, right? And they're like, oh, because we've been doing this for years. I'm like, yes, that's awesome tradition, but how do we know? How do we really know? And, and they're like, well, we're just following tradition. And that's an example, like, the work that we do, when we know what our community wants something, it's because we ask them. We include their voice, we include their input, we include their, we assess their needs and wants. And that's how Latino Network does, does our work. They don't do that. They're following a tradition. And those traditions are usually for the good, uh, for good or worse, we need to reassess those traditions and, and evaluate if that's what our community wants. So with that, I'll leave uh, Antonio to share his end, and then we'll go to Q&A. Thank you, Anna. And uh, I think that I admire your leadership, and then I have seen your work through the last five, six years, and, and uh, uh, you have been really a leader in our community to to be finding those spaces where decisions are made. And I think that they, not just for the Latino community, but for uh, also for other communities, it is important to break in into those systems that really don't reflect the needs of our communities. And by your word, I think that we are, we are doing that. So thank you. I appreciate that. And I, <clears throat> as a, I said in my introduction, uh, the work that I do at Latino Network is related to the immigration issues. So I, my position is a call immigration navigator because I have to do during the scope of my work, uh, 
uh, help uh, immigrants to navigate those uh, legal systems that they uh, uh, can uh, help them to either adjust their status in, in, in the United States or find the ways in order to be included in our communities. So by the privilege of citizenship, uh, that's part of my work and I'm so excited to be, to be doing that because it seems like a currently uh, with this uh, uh, current administration, federal administration, we have a sense that at least more humanitarian immigration policies are gonna be put in place. So we are going to talk about uh, immigration this morning and how different approaches to immigration have evolved in Oregon's history. I believe that the, in order to understand the reality that we live in today, it's uh, important to understand what was the past and why we are here right now. I believe that the goal of the US immigration policy has always been to identify uh, which people to welcome and which people to keep out of the country. Our conversation, of course, today will be focused on Oregon. I will provide an, a brief overview on how immigrants in this state have had challenges to overcome discrimination, harsh immigration policies, and social, exclu uh, social exclusion. To begin with, uh, I'm going to highlight some policies that for me demonstrate the early institutionalization of racism and hate towards non-white immigrants and people of color. So if we go back to history in 1849, the territorial government of Oregon prohibited free and enslaved folks from entry to Oregon. Ten years later, after being, uh, being admitted to the Union, Oregon was the only no slavery state with a constitutional mandate to prohibit blacks altogether. So if we, if we reflect on those uh, passages of the history, we start making sense about where all that racism came from uh, for immigrants in Oregon. To give you another example, uh, between 1850 and 1880, Chinese immigrants arrived to Oregon prompted by the discovery of gold. Oregonians at that moment saw Chinese immigration with suspicion, so Oregon was not very welcoming to them. While Chinese immigrants were successful in mining, and other economic activities, policies were implemented to increase their taxes and limit their activity. So this is an important passage for Oregon that many people don't know. A lot of Oregonians don't, uh, are not aware of those uh, racist and exclusionary passages in history. In 1987, it was declared that German and Scandinavians were the best foreign born immigrants. So the focus of business people at that time and, polit and politicians uh, uh, was to recruit people from Europe because it was believed that they could be successfully incorporated into the Oregon economy and mainstream life. So for me, for me, it's clear that it's clear that the, since Oregon inception. Oregon has had a history of tensions and traditions that have confronted new immigrants groups with different approaches, creating openings, openings and barriers for, for, for inclusion. Uh, it seems uh, to me that Oregon has emerged over time as something hybrid between states like California, which has strong policies to support immigrants inclusion, but also at different moments in history, Oregon seems to be like Arizona, which implements harsh restrictions on Latino immigrants. <clears throat> Today, uh, Oregon is still one of the least racially diverse states across the nation. This is the result, of course, of the decisions made by its founders, but also 
decisions made by subsequent leaders who still some of them continue to draw distinctions among desirable and undesirable newcomers to the state. Those distinctions are often based on social hierarchies, including race, ethnicity, as well as the strong need for cheap labor. So I think that the, when we understand how Oregon sometimes needs cheap labor, we are going to understand why the presence of immigrants coming from Latin America and from Central America are, are here in Oregon. So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna be jumping to a period in Oregon history when a strong presence of Latin immigrants, many Mexicans, began. So labor needs associated with the uh, World War II influenced efforts to recruit immigrants to Oregon. Uh, during the 1940s, Oregonians pressured the federal government to address war, uh, wartime labor short shortages. So Mexicans were brought to Oregon under the Bracero program, which important workers from Mexico for agricultural labor. So these workers imported from Mexico during the 40s were considered like a disposable a labor a, a human beings. They had to be strong, healthy, and willing to work long hours in the fields in agricultural industry. When they were sick, when they were now up to the demands that the labor uh, was uh, putting on, onto them. So they were sent back to Mexico. So this is kind of the, the, the distinction in between having a human being working for you as an employer or having something who is disposable. When you don't need it, you, you can send them back to their country. So many of those workers, and I am emphasizing this, uh, in history because it explains how the presence of Latino immigrants started to be more visible in Oregon. So many of those workers experienced poor living conditions and also were paid substandard wages. Also Mexican workers at that time suffered from a discriminatory treatment and that reflected the racist attitudes in the, uh, in the communities where they work mainly in the Willamette Valley and Eastern Oregon. So is this during this period of time that uh, we, uh, we start seeing in which ways race, immigration status, country of origin and lack of access to services intersect, uh, creating the social exclusion for uh, Latino immigrants in Oregon. By uh, 1957, there were more than 12,000 Spanish speakers in this state. But at that time, they not only worked on the fields, they were also hired in the food and manufacturing industries, as well as emerging as Latino business owners. But uh, with the presence of Latinos, hate incidents surface as well. For example, in the city of Nisa, Oregon, an organization called Siempre Adelante, always forward in English, was created after a white youth killed a Mexican. And that crime was unpunished. So the system didn't, the, the justice system didn't care about a Mexican being killed. So at that time is where Soon after PECUN, which is a, one of the most influential organizations protecting the rights of immigrants, in particular for farm workers, was created as well, other community organizations and churches to provide social services, job training and housing to Latino immigrants. So around the 1960s is when we start, we start as a community organizing to challenge those aggressions, those acts of hate against Latino immigrants. 
And then another important passage in history was in, in 1986, when uh, federal lawmakers passed the Immigration Reform Control Act, IRCA, addressing undocumented immigrants coming from Central America and many of them from Mexico. This legislation offered the opportunity of legalization of mainly agricultural workers. In Oregon at that time, approximately 100,000 undocumented immigrants were living in Oregon and they were eligible for amnesty. However, many, many of them didn't apply because they were scared. They were scared about their family members. If they have any family member that couldn't qualify for this program, they feared ICE uh, or immigration enforcement action. So uh, it is believed that 15,000 Mexicans settled down in Oregon as a result of the Brazil program and after as a result of the amnesty program. So 10 years later uh, of the IRCA uh, Immigration Act, Latino Network was uh, founded by community leaders that were concerned about the lack of adequate resources to meet the needs of the growing Latino community. So, but in response with this immigration amnesty and community organizing white supremacist groups surface in Oregon. In, in May of 2006, in response to pro-immigrant rallies, a group called Oregonians for Immigration Reform who favored fewer uh, legal immigrants and crackdowns on undocumented immigrants claim that its memberships double. I recall because I was said that this was part of my personal experience. At that moment, Jim Ludwig, who was the president of this organization said, we don't want Mexicans infected or beautiful, infected or beautiful Oregon coast. So we have to fight, we have to fight against immigration. That was kind of the posture of this group. And also uh, the same year, this group uh, and the Oregon chapter of the Mini Minuteman Civil Defense Corps led violent protests in Cornelius to intimidate uh, <clears throat> to intimidate uh, contractors and homeowners who hire Latino day laborers. So, and most recently, uh, recently uh, debates about immigration, both legal and illegal, intensified with Donald Trump launched his campaign as a presidential candidate. Since day one, Trump referred to Mexican immigrants as drug dealers criminal and rapist created xenophobic attitudes towards immigration across the nation. So at this time, Latino Network responded by incorporating educational programs, working closely with Latino immigrants community to educate them around their constitutional rights, family safety, and dealing with instances of hate. So, it is estimated that during the Trump presidency, more than 400 policies were proposed on immigration. So most of them were aimed to limit legal immigration and to harshly punish unauthorized immigration. For instance, family separation, when people uh, were uh, getting at the border, so parents were separated from their kids in order to the uh, American government to send the message, you are not welcome in the country. If you come with your kids, you're gonna be separated from them. So why I, uh, I have highlighted the way that the Trump campaign addressing them if, and presidency targeted Latino immigrants, we were not the only ones. The Muslim travel ban affected people from seven countries, regardless of immigration status. In Portland, we were collectively traumatized on May 2007, when Jeremy Joseph Christi, uh, uh, fatally stabbed two men and injured a third one that when he was confronted for shooting racial uh, 
racist and anti-Muslim slurs at two uh, teenagers girls. So under this context, Latino Network has emerged as a leader in responses to the hate, systematic racism, and discrimination that continues to operate in our communities. This has been done while further, uh, furthering the development of our programming and resources that center leadership, educational opportunities, family engagement, and addressing the disparities of access to health and economic opportunities. So in order to accomplish that, uh, currently Latino Network in partnership with other organizations have gained greater political influence at both state and local levels, convincing governments, entities, and educational institutions to provide additional protections for immigrants who, who lack status. And finally, I just say, want to give you an example of what we have done uh, last year when the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, pandemic disproportionately affected our community, Latino Network was one of the leaders in giving financial support for unarmed workers that were left out of the federal stimulus and safety net programs only because their immigration status. So far, until today, this coalition has distributed around 60 million of dollars to almost 40 dozen individuals that don't qualify for any federal uh, financial support. So many of those individuals are agricultural workers that even though they are considered essential workers, they don't have access to financial support in, at the beginning of the pandemic. And I just want to highlight our participation as co-founders of the Portland United Against Coalition, uh, Portland United Against Hate Coalition. That, uh, that participation gave us the opportunity to try hate incidents or crimes that are perpetrated against immigrants and individuals of color. So the, now the city of Portland has been able to start mapping what kind of hate incidents occur within city limits. So as you can see, there are still many issues that we have to be fighting on, but uh, I believe that Latino Network uh, together in partnership with other organizations like uh, probably many of you represent today here, so we can do the work together. Thank you so much, Antonio. Um, and thank you so much, Anna, for, for being able to give a little overview about the work that we've done and how um, historically our community has been impacted in more than one way in the systems that are currently in place or that have been in place in our state. Um, I'm gonna move us on to our Q&A section. I'm gonna start with our first question from Beth. Um, this question is for Anna. And the question says, have you considered, or is there a network to talk about retention of teachers and administrators of color in addition to recruiting and hiring? I'm in GBD, GBSC, and that's a concern. Um, how may we best support our staff of color and how do we do interrupt and decenter whiteness in our system? So Anna, if you don't mind answering this question, um, and before I pass it on to you, please, everybody, feel free to continue asking questions in the Q&A section. Thank you. Beth, thank you for the question. That is awesome. And wow, like, yeah, let's let's uh, uh, come together and create something. Because you know what? A lot of times uh, when there isn't opportunities, we have to create them. And we have to not be afraid to create what we need. I know that, you know, back when I first, I, when I was a two year, the, my first two years of teaching, my first year actually, I came as a teacher with this big vision of the type of teacher that I wanted to be for my students. And, and let me tell you, a lot of times that, that is, uh, has to do with how we experience education. And, and to me, I went to school in Mexico and I really love my, my teachers in Mexico and, and the way they were, you know, uh, connected with students. And then I come to the U.S. and, and 
the education is totally the opposite for me. Uh, no connection. If you were to ask me for, for the name of one of my teachers from elementary or middle school, I will. I don't remember, honestly, probably I blocked that. But anyway, um, so coming, you know, uh, with this big vision of what kind of teacher I wanted to be for my students, I, my first year of teaching, I worked for a small school district, um, the only Latina, there was no other Latinos uh, in the faculty, I was the only Latina. I became the teacher, the counselor, the nurse, the coach, the advisor, the, um, everything, everything for, for my students, for my Latino students and their families. So when that happens, obviously, you know, you get burned out right away. You get, you know, tired of your time is consumed by your, by your, your work. And, and that affects your personal life that affects everything around you. And so we have to evaluate that what is happening in our, in our schools uh, with our teachers of color. Because again, a lot of times as Latino Network, when we come in into the schools and, and we meet with administrators and say, hey, we have this awesome program for Latino students. What do you think? Is it a good fit or not? And usually the answer is like, oh, we already have something for Latino students, right? And it's like, okay, what is that something? You know, you have, if your, your students are 71% students of color and you have one program for, for Latinos, one program for black students, one program for Asian Americans, you still don't have them covered. There's still a lot of students out there that need additional support here and there. And so, you know, bringing those community partners into the schools to support and, and the, the efforts that the schools are, are having, we, our work is rooted around culturally specific practices and we aim, <clears throat> excuse me, we aim to make sure that there's communication between family, student and school. And, and that's like how I paint the picture, right? Every time I introduce a new program to the school. So definitely Beth, consider this uh, community partners in supporting teachers and supporting students. And, and then also, you know, discussing, um, having these conversations that are really tough on how to be more anti-racist, you know, in the schools, because let's face it and let's call it out. You know, if teachers of color are not being retained, if they're uh, leaving school district from school district, there's something happening there. And, and if we're not calling it out, then we continue with being oppressed in a hidden um, way that everyone's afraid to reveal it. And, and so we need to come forward with that. We need to become to, you know, come together and be able to call it out. And I think that's, that's what we're talking about here in terms of making sure that the systems that are oppressing us are revealed and we talk about them and we find solutions for them. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, we have a question here from Patricia. It says, how are the city and county resources and partners for the network? Um, I'm going to assume that you're talking about Latino network. Um, Antonio, I don't know if you want to start answering this question and, may, and maybe afterwards pass it on to Anna since you both work in close partnership with the city of Portland and um, Multnomah County. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Martina and Patricia. Thank you for the question. Um, as I said in my presentation, uh, I believe that uh, Oregon is kind of hybrid state in terms of having good moments for immigration inclusion or immigrant inclusion, or having bad moments where uh, uh, situations are really challenging for the immigrant community. At this moment, I would say that uh, we are having that good moment pro immigrants uh, in the state and um, we are in, in, in the area that I work uh, in the immigration uh, legal navigation services, we are having the support of the city of Portland and also the support of Multnomah County. So uh, thanks to that uh, support, uh, which was not easy to, to get because we really for five, seven years, we had to, lose, uh, to do a lot of advocacy in order to make elected officials understand 
this is the need that uh, our immigrant community has here in the metro area. And we were able to get uh, funding uh, to support uh, those immigrants that needed legal representation and didn't have the mean to pay for a private attorney. So it started there because we got some funding from the city of Portland, we got some funding from Monoma County. And now I can say that the Oregon legislature is, uh, is supporting a bill that could provide millions of dollars in order to pay to, to support those immigrants that need a legal representation across the state. So I would say that our partnership right now with the, uh, the government is being great. And also uh, the partnership with other organizations that are pro-immigrants has been really strong. It is the way that we are advancing the benefits and the rights of our immigrant community across the state. Thank you so much, Antonio. Um, Anna, would you like to add something or do you want to hop on to the next question? No, I think Antonio covered it. Great. Um, so we're gonna move on now to Beth, um, different Beth uh, question. Um, Anna, I think it's great how you're inspiring young Latino students to think about being teachers. How hard was it to inspire adults to run for office? What were the challenges? Um, yeah, um, actually the, 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 the students that are in the teacher pathway program, they're all adults. So I just kind of wanted to clarify that because that's different. I mean, I have worked with youth for like forever, and this is the first time that I'm working with adults. So it's, it's a little bit different, but they're, you know, just as excited, you know, uh, it, it, it it wasn't hard. Running for office is not what we do, period. Okay, so we don't find those spaces as something that we, 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 that is our goal to do or something that we aspire to do, right? And so to me, running for office was, was an invitation to run. And if I had not had that invitation, I would have never known that I actually could be in that space. And, and it's, it's probably the experience for a lot of us um, uh, who are part of this uh, communities of color because we're still in a, in, in a state where we just wanna do for ourselves and, and move forward. But when that idea was introduced to me, I'm like, oh, what, I can do that? And, um, and then it was like, well, no, how am I gonna do that, right? I, I have no idea, I have no clue, no knowledge, no, no way, no how. And so uh, the person that invited me to run was Eddie Morales. He's a, a councilman from the city of Gresham. And he's actually the founder of East County Rising, which is an organization in East County supporting a new elected, um, people of color to, to run for office. And so he invited me and he said, you just say yes or no. And if you say yes, I'll help you through the, through the pathway. And I'm like, oh, okay, well in that case, yeah, right? And so I decided to run and East County Rising was the backbone of supporting my campaign the whole way. And if it wasn't for that, I would have like, never known that that was a, an opportunity for me. And so um, there's a lot of challenges why we don't run for office. Uh, and we saying uh, people of color, you know, there's first, we don't know the system. We don't know the process. Second, we don't have the support that can carry us through that, through that um, whole um, campaigning. Third, it's all this is volunteer. Like who has time to volunteer, right? We need to work. We need to provide for our families. We need to be there for our families, especially if you have uh, small kiddos, you know, we don't, we, we can't be volunteering our time just cause, you know, and, and that's a lot of times that's the mentality. But when someone comes and tells you, wait, Anna, yes, you're going to be volunteering, but you're going to have this opportunity to make change and to voice um, that those voices that have never been heard and bring them forward and, and talk about the issues that affect them. I'm like, 
oh yeah well that's the, that's what I want to do right and so um but yeah and then the campaigning process you need money you need sometimes as people of color we're afraid that we don't want to put ourselves in a spotlight either we don't want people to 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 know our personal lives we don't want people to really um we're afraid of of criticism we're afraid of being bashed we're afraid of this whole racist system that can really attack us in a way that is going to affect us mentally emotionally physically we don't want that but you know what it takes a lot of bravery to do that and it it takes uh the initiative of wanting to step up and face that because if we don't then we're going to continue not being in the right spaces Thank you so much, Anna. Um, we're going to go on to Robin's question. This is the last question we're going to unfortunately be able to um, answer live today. Um, so Robin says, ORS 336.074, which is a law, uh, requires that teaching in Oregon be conducted in English. The, this precludes things like dual immersion classes and privileges English and English speakers above speakers of, la of other languages. As a teacher who started out in California, learning this was learning this law felt like a slap in the face. Does the Tito Network have a plan to change this law? For you, Anna. <laughs> and I'm learning, you know, I, uh, I'm a learner just as much as I am a teacher. So I had no idea about this law. And, and that's, that's good to know because those are the type of laws that we need to tackle. Those are the type of laws that we need to revisit. And, and, and because again, talking about like the tradition that I, I mentioned earlier, a lot of times we do things that, the way that have been done year after year after year without even thinking about the evolution of our of our communities, the evolution of our of our society, considering that that the that, 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 diversification of our people. And we continue to have these laws in place, so, similar to what Antonio was talking about, all these immigration laws that were placed at the uh, beginning when Oregon was becoming a territory. Uh, we have to revisit all that in, in making sure that uh, we uh, analyze to see if that's still what works for our communities. And so in, in Latino Network, we have an advocacy department and we have an advocacy director that is very engaged in the le legislative sessions currently, who is working towards uh, making sure that whatever bills are presented are, you know, uh, are supporting our communities and which bills we need to support and push forward. And so we have already uh, a department that could be involved in, in, in that work as well. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, unfortunately, we've reached the end of our session. It went really fast. So I encourage everybody to reach out if you have additional questions. I wanted to thank everybody for joining. Um, just some closing remarks. I wanted to um, emphasize, re-emphasize on what Anna and Antonio have been speaking. Um, some of you may think that our community doesn't want to be engaged in certain aspects of civic life, but in reality, just like Anna and Antonio have been saying, there are systems in place currently that really prevent us from speaking up and, and feeling comfortable in navigating systems that have historically been created to keep us quiet. Um, Having said that, we are so happy and so proud to work at an organization that step-by-step step is trying to break these barriers from the education system to the juvenile system to our laws and our advocacy. And we couldn't be prouder of the work that we do on a daily basis. So on that note, I encourage everybody to reach out, to learn more about the work that we do, to get involved, to volunteer, um, and if that's not an option, then, you know, as a nonprofit, you guys are also invited to, to contribute to the work that we do. Um, so I'm going to be dropping some additional links on the chat so that you can get further involved and volunteer and donate. Um, and we just thank everybody for your time. And we hope that you had as much of a great of a time that we did, just like we did. Um, so on that note, 
again, thank you. And Anna, Antonio, I don't know if you guys want to say anything else besides, before we close. Um, thank you both so much. No, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, Martina, I put our emails on the chat. I am happy to have a conversation or receive an invitation if you uh, still want to talk more about the topic. And I just want to say thank you as well. And for all people that participated in this conversation this morning, and just to remind that there is no one organization that could uh, be doing the work by itself. We need to get together. We need to uh, find those common challenges that our communities have. And we have to be building coalitions in order to occupy those spaces, as Anna said, where decisions are made and our voices could be heard. So thank you so much for, for participating. Muchas gracias a todos y que tengan un muy buen día. Bye.